All right, well, let's, um, let's go ahead and read our text this morning. We actually have here two different accounts, both of which are taking place on the Sabbath, giving our Lord Jesus Christ the opportunity to show his authority over the Sabbath. And again, we, we, we're going to just look at the implications of what that actually means. If, if you or I were to do this, that would be blasphemy, but not for Jesus because of who he is. Now let's, um, let's begin by reading the text in Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> Luke writes this, Now it happened that he was passing through some grain fields on a Sabbath, and his disciples were picking the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating the grain. But some of the Pharisees said, Why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, uh, answering them said, have you not even read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for any to eat except the priests alone, and gave it to his com uh, companions? And he was saying to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. <clears throat> On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And there was a man there whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he healed on the Sabbath so that they might find reason to accuse him. But he knew what they were thinking. And he said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he got up and came forward. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to destroy it? After looking around at them all, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they themselves were filled with rage and discussed together what they might do to Jesus. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, again, you recall Luke has been showing us Jesus' authority, and I would you know, submit to you that every one of these examples is meant to show us exactly who Jesus is, because no one can wield this kind of authority except he be God. Well, Luke has shown us Jesus' authority over the devil. He can resist the devil. He can command the devil, and the devil obeys him. He has authority over his own life. No one can take it from him. I mean, none of us can say that. But Jesus can say that, but he will lay it down willingly. That's going to be important when it comes time for Jesus to die because no one took his life. He gave it for us freely, again, as the table reminds us of this morning. <clears throat> he has authority in the word. No one ever spoke like this one speaks. He has authority over the demons. They feared Jesus. When he commanded them, they submitted immediately and obeyed him. He has authority over sickness. He commands it to leave and it obeys him as well. He has authority over the fish. He commanded them to fill the nets and that's exactly what they did. And Jesus has authority over men. My sheep hear my voice, they know me, and they follow me, Jesus says. He called Peter, he called Andrew, he called James and John to follow him and they immediately left their boats and did so. Now, last week, <clears throat> Luke showed us Jesus' authority over sin, over guilt, the, the, the crimes we have committed against God himself. Uh, he forgave the paralytic, and then he proved that he actually had the authority to do this by healing him. And we saw his authority also to call and to save whomever he will in the conversion of Levi. Remember that Levi was one of the most despised among the Jews because he was a tax collector, because he was helping the Romans oppress his own people for profit. If there was anything the Jews hated worse than Gentiles, he was essentially the tax collectors. Jesus not only offered Levi eternal life, which is in itself a great privilege, he also gave him his Holy Spirit so that Levi could receive this life. And that was powerfully demonstrated in his life when he immediately called together all of his friends and associates and invited Jesus to come so that they might hear him, so that they too might be saved. 
those that experience God's grace immediately want to go and introduce Jesus to other people so that they too might experience grace. That's what the love of God does, moves us to do. Now this morning, Luke continues to show us Jesus' authority in one more very important area, and that is over the, the Sabbath. And he does it in two separate accounts. First of all, when the disciples were feeding themselves on the Sabbath, and secondly, when Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath. Now, first of all, we see Luke's account of the disciples feeding themselves on the Sabbath. As you know, they were traveling from town to town, and as they did, they happened to be passing through the grain fields uh, on the Sabbath day. And as they did, the disciples were, were picking the heads of grain, rubbing them together in their hands in order to separate the grains, and then they were eating it. When some of the Pharisees saw what they were doing, they immediately began to do what they do best, which is accuse. They accused the disciples of breaking the Sabbath. Verse 2, why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, one thing we need to realize here is, first of all, that they weren't accusing the disciples of stealing. You know, we might actually think that that's what they're doing because they're taking somebody else's grain. The grain didn't belong to them. But we do need to realize that God gave them the right to eat from their neighbor's field as long it was, as it was only to satisfy their immediate hunger. They couldn't harvest their field for them, but they could take what they needed. Moses writes in Deuteronomy 23, verses 24 and 25, When you enter your neighbor's vineyard, then you may eat grapes until you are fully satisfied, but you shall not put any in your basket. When you enter your neighbor's standing grain, then you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not wield a sickle in your neighbor's standing grain. <coughs> so as people are traveling, or perhaps the poor who needed to be fed, could come into one of these um, fields, essentially, and take what they needed for that particular occasion. Now, that's not something that is practiced today that I'm aware of. I don't think our neighbors would necessarily appreciate our going into their, uh, their groves, you know, into their, uh, their fields and feeding ourselves. But in Jesus' day, it was perfectly acceptable. That wasn't the issue. The issue was they were doing work on the Sabbath day. Now again, let's remember what we've just read in the Ten Commandments about the Sabbath. <coughs> in Exodus 20, verse 8, the Lord says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What that essentially means is remember the Sabbath day, which is a day designated by the Lord, one day in seven. Remember that day to keep it holy, which means to separate it from the rest of the other days to the Lord. That's what holy means. When something is holy, it means it's set apart from secular or common use to sacred use or to the Lord's use. Now, how are we to do that? Well, the Lord says in the fourth commandment, by not working on that day. <clears throat> I think we understand by now the word Sabbath means rest. Remember the day of rest. Remember this day that I've given to you that's called the day of rest, in order to rest on this day. Uh, verses 9 and 10, we read this in Exodus 20. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. So you are to rest. I am to rest on this day, and actually I would be resting if I wasn't a pastor uh, priests who are in the, the temple, they're working and they're not breaking the Sabbath because they're doing necessary work. Uh, this is necessary work, but we're not to be doing unnecessary work. And then the commandment goes on to say, not only are we supposed to rest and not do any work, but we're also not supposed to make anyone or anything else do any work. In verse 10, in it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. Everyone is supposed to rest. And why is that? Because, the commandment goes on to say, our Lord tells us, this is what he did, 
at the end of the creation week. He saw everything that he had done on the seventh day and he, he rested on the seventh day and he blessed that day because on that day he rested. He did that not because he needed rest, but because he was setting a pattern for us. That's where we get the seven-day work week that we have now, or I should say the seven-day week. It shouldn't be a seven-day work week. There should be one day of rest. And this is the day he set aside for us from the very beginning to be a blessing for us. And that's what Exodus 20 verse 11 says. <clears throat> for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now the Lord, as we said, wants us to rest on this particular day. But if, if we could get into this more deeply, which we're not going to because we're going to focus on two main things about the Sabbath day, we would also see that he wants us not only to rest from working, but he wants us to rest <clears throat> from the world. And when you have an opportunity... Read the uh, memory verse that's in your bulletin that basically explains what the Lord wants us to do on, on the Sabbath day, which is, again, not think about the things of the world, but rather to think about the things of Him. He wants us to withdraw from the world, from the things that tend to draw our minds and our hearts away from Him so that we might spend the time with Him. The Sabbath is really, as we've, we sang in that hymn, is meant to be a foretaste of heaven. It's meant to be a picture of heaven. It's meant to remind us that we're just passing through this world on our way to heaven. It's, it's meant to be basically, again, a type or a shadow or a picture of the heavenly rest. Now, what's the problem here in our text? The disciples weren't resting. They were working. So what does Jesus do? Does Jesus, thinking about the commandments and, you know, being the lawgiver, side with the Pharisees and rebuke them for doing this? No, he doesn't. Jesus defends them. We read in Luke 6, verses 3 through 5. And Jesus answering them, the Pharisees who were accusing his disciples, he said, Have you not even read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God, and took and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for any to eat except the priests alone, and gave it to his companions. And he was saying to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, I want you to notice three things from what Jesus says here. And the first is perhaps the one that should impact us most strongly. Jesus declares himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. And what that means is, Jesus is saying, I am its master. I have authority over the Sabbath. Now, realize that what Jesus is actually saying here, although the Jews don't call him out on it, is he's declaring himself to be God. I mean, can you imagine the religious leaders who were the ones who used, or used to being in control seeing this rabbi claim to have lordship over the Sabbath day? Uh, God is the one who gave us the Sabbath. He established it at the beginning, as we've already seen, and only God has the right to tell us whether it remains in force or not or what may or may not be done on this particular day. But Jesus is saying, I can do that. He says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, secondly, when Jesus declares himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath, I think he's also telling us something that seems to be fairly obvious but is missed today. And that is that the Sabbath continues in the New Covenant because you can't be Lord over something that doesn't exist. If Jesus was meaning to abrogate it, he would, but he didn't abrogate it. Rather, he corrected the Pharisees as to their understanding of it. Now, remember that um, at the end of Matthew's gospel, when Jesus gives the Great Commission to his disciples, this is one thing we really need to bear in mind. He says, I want you to go out into all the world and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the triune God, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Okay? Now, oftentimes, one of the arguments against the continuance of the Sabbath is that Jesus was talking to Jews, and we know they had a Sabbath, 
But think about what Jesus says in the Great Commission. I want you, disciples, as you go to the, the, the nations, the Gentiles, I want you to teach them to observe all that I commanded you, Jews. Okay? That is rather global. The teaching that Jesus is doing through, the, you know, through his ministry here is not just for the Jews for some future period of time when they turn back to him, which is what some Christians believe. But this was for the New Testament, New Covenant Church. So Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the one who's going to tell us what may or may not be done on this day. Now third, when he says what he says, we also need to realize that Jesus was not making a change in the Sabbath. He was simply correcting what the Pharisees were teaching. And as we know, the Pharisees got quite a bit wrong. If you read um, uh, Matthew chapter 5 and chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus spends the majority of his time there correcting the, the bad teaching they were getting from the Pharisees. Remember, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. And when he does that, he's correcting essentially their teaching on the commandments. You know, he talks about murder, he talks about adultery, and then he goes on into acts of piety and so forth. But he's correcting their misunderstanding of the commandments. Here is another misunderstanding they had of the commandments, which he is correcting. Now, what he's telling us here is this, that when the Lord says don't work, but rest, there are exceptions to that, just as there are exceptions to some of the other commandments. Now, he uses an illustration Normally, he says, it wouldn't be lawful for David and his men to go into the tabernacle and to eat the consecrated bread because that was only for the priests. It was only lawful for them to eat. They were the only ones who could. But he says, here is an instance where they could eat it and not be guilty because they needed it to preserve their lives. If you go back and look at that particular uh, occasion, David and his men were on the run from Saul and so forth, and there was no food anywhere, and that was the only food that was available, so the priest gave it to them in order to preserve their lives. Now, the point is this. The Lord never intended the law regarding this bread, the, the consecrated bread, to be kept at the risk of someone's life. Here, we'll keep this law. You guys can just die. No, that, that's not what the Lord is saying, okay? No, we're going to use this bread, even though it's not lawful normally, but we can use it in this occasion. And in the same way, the Lord never intended the Sabbath day to endanger life, but to preserve life. We need rest, and we need to step back from the world to remind ourselves on a regular basis what life is really all about. It's all about God's glory. It's not about our pleasure. It's not about what we want to do. It's about what God wants, okay? It's meant for him, Jesus tells us in Mark 2.27. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So if it's made for us, that means it's not meant to endanger us in any way. So we can and we must show mercy on the Sabbath. In this case, mercy to ourselves. Uh, the disciples can meet their needs. They can go into their neighbor's standing grain. They can get what they need to satisfy their hunger. The Westminster Assembly and the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is, again, our confession here, calls this kind of work a work of necessity, a work of necessity. It's a work of mercy. We're not to do unnecessary work, work that we can do on some other day of the week, but we may do what we need to do in order to preserve our lives. That's why, you know, the medical field is open today. That's why we have the fire department open today and the police department open today and why there's doctors and nurses working today because if they didn't, people would die, okay? So those are necessary works. They have to be done on this day. That's fine. But there's a lot of things being done today that don't really need to be done and those are the ones that shouldn't be done. This is a day of rest. Now, we see a second exception in the next example, which is really the same as the first, only with a different application when Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath day. Now, Luke tells us that on a subsequent Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue. Remember, we just looked at the fact that God's given us a day of rest, that we might spend it with him. And by the way, that, that's the whole day, okay, that we might spend the whole day with him. 
Jesus again reminds us in this example that God gave us the Sabbath to do that. What he does is he goes to the synagogue because the people of God were meeting together for worship on that day. And he gives that day to us so that we might get together to worship and to fellowship, that we might be refreshed, rested bodily, rested in our souls. Now, at this particular synagogue, there was a man with a withered hand. The scribes and the Pharisees knew Jesus healed slash worked uh, in healing the sick. And so they watched him closely to see whether or not he would do this on the Sabbath purely for the reason to accuse him. Now, Jesus knew what they were thinking. You know, sometimes it's written on their faces. You know, I know what you guys are thinking. Holy Spirit might have revealed it to him. But either way, he didn't let it stop him. He knew what they wanted. He told the man to come forward. And after he did, he challenged his accusers. Verse 9, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to destroy it? Well, I think we know it was never God's intention to harm or to destroy anyone on any day, whether it's the Sabbath or any other day, unless that person is unjustly trying to take away your life, trying to harm you or somebody else that is, you know, innocent, that needs to be protected, in which case you can harm this other person. You can even take away their life. That's one of the hierarchies of uh, the commandments. We are not to murder, but if someone's trying to kill you, you can, you can take their life if you need to in self-defense, if they're trying unjustly to take away your life. Well, the point is, it's never right to harm or to destroy a life unless that exception occurs. But that isn't what Jesus is talking about. Can I do this on Sabbath? He's asking this question, whether it's right to see somebody in need on the Sabbath and to do nothing about it, do nothing to help them. In the name of keeping the Sabbath, I, I'm holy, I'm, I'm not going to work, you can suffer, is essentially, is that right? Jesus is saying, is that right? Uh, should we help them if we can help them? Or should we make them suffer for the sake of keeping the fourth commandment? Well, Jesus waited for an answer, but of course there was no answer forthcoming because they knew that to answer this question would expose their hypocrisy. And of course not to answer it would do the same but they thought that was the better route to go. That's why Jesus asked the question, because whether they answered it or didn't answer it, their hypocrisy would still be exposed. But even though Jesus knew that they wanted to trap him, he didn't let that stop him from doing the right thing. He told the man to stretch out his hand, and the man obviously had faith. He believed that Jesus could heal him, so he stretched out his withered hand, and he was healed. Now, we know their reaction. They were immediately outraged. They began discussing among themselves what they might do to Jesus, essentially, from the other Gospels, how they might destroy him. Destroy him for what? For helping a man who was in need. Okay? That, that's how twisted things get in the mind of the wicked. I mean, just look around us. Sometimes we wonder, why is it that people are behaving the way they are? Why do they promote and endorse and support and rejoice over things that are absolutely wicked? Well, there's a, here's a man who was healed on the Sabbath and all they could think about was killing the man who did it, okay? So that's how twisted and irrational sin actually is. It's evil and it twists good. We can't expect it to think rationally. But again, here is again another exception. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Now, to conclude, remember the Lord gave us the Sabbath. He gave us a day off so that we can get some physical rest. We, we need it. It's been proven scientifically. If we don't get a certain amount of rest, our bodies will run down and it can kill us. Workaholics run themselves into an early grave. But the Lord also gave it to us to rest our souls so that we could draw back from the world for a time and join together in worship so that we can be refreshed in our souls and be reminded that there is a better rest waiting for us in heaven after our work on earth is done. Is that a bad thing? I mean, that to me sounds like a good thing, and that's the way we need to see it as a good thing. 
the Sabbath was made for man. And what that means is for our benefit, for our advantage. And the only way we actually receive that advantage or that benefit is by doing what it is the command requires of us. But again, there are exceptions to this commandment just as there are for, for some of the other commandments. The Bible says that we are to obey the authorities unless they contradict God. Then we need to obey God rather than men. The Bible says that we are to protect life. You shall not murder unless somebody is trying to take away our life or the life of somebody else unjustly. We are to tell the truth unless those who are asking us intend to use that truth for some evil purpose. Then we are justified in withholding the truth from them. And we are to rest on the Sabbath day, um, but we may also take care of our needs. Jesus doesn't want us to go hungry. I think probably the majority of us got up and had breakfast, right? I mean, we made breakfast. We may have taken a shower and did work cleaning ourselves up and so forth, but we did certain things to take care of our needs. Jesus is telling us we may do that. And we may also help take care of the needs of others. We can relieve suffering, the suffering of others. We can share the gospel with others. We can do acts of, of benevolence or acts of mercy to help other people. But we do need to remember this finally. These are exceptions, okay? They're, they're not the rule. The Lord of the Sabbath tells us. He wants us. He commands us. It's our duty to do this, to rest and to worship on this day so that we might be stronger and better equipped to serve him. That, that's the reason why he gave us this day, uh, so that we might be better, that we might be stronger, that we might be rested. I think we all know the benefits of being rested. Jesus commands us, rest. And we know the benefit of spending time with the Lord. The Lord says, spend time with me. He's doing that because he knows we need it. So may the Lord give us the grace to do what he calls us to do because it is for our good to take the day off and to worship him. Well, may the Lord uh, grant us the grace to do that. As I've said, let's bow in just a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us receive this word as the Lord intends it um, for our good.